and when you get people that do remedies of different kinds to fix the problem, and you, you get something, well, let's say like a rain dance, and the Indians used to do these different dances to make it rain. I personally believe that the success of a rain, rain dance has far more to do with the timing of the dance than the quality of the dancing. You understand what I'm saying there? So, one of the things that I believe that is really vital is when we cover something, I'm not asking you to take anything I say on faith, nothing. As a matter of fact, only a fool does that. Because what's true for you is what you've observed for yourself to be true. Like if you can take this information and you can compare it to the world you live in and go, I see how that fits, then it would become your information. It would become something you know. It wouldn't be simply something you heard me say. Now, when we talk about a goal, over on the chart here, you'll see where it says, be, do, have. And I think most of you can read, yeah, from where you're sitting, all this crap's been moved out of the way. So you look at all goals fall in the category of be, do, have. The reason that all goals fall in the category of be, do, have is those are the three conditions of existence. Goals you could have if you looked at past, present, future. So you had been, done, had, or didn't be, didn't do, didn't have. You understand in the past. But the present would be be, do, have. Most goals that people are working on are a future goal, something for later, and that's going to have will be, will do, or will have, or won't be, won't do, won't have, if that makes sense. So you have be, do, have. Now, there's two versions of it given. You see there's a plus sign and a minus sign before the be, before the do, and before the have. So you actually have six different categories. You have six different possible categories for a goal. You would have will be, won't be, will do, won't do, will have, won't have. And it's important to take this up because if you look at the nature of thought, and you go, here's my goal. If you put, if you have a goal that is what I'm going to call a negative goal, and I'm using the term negative here, like let's say you had a goal of I want to stop war. But somebody else had a goal of I want a stick of candy. The person who wants the stick of candy is factually in better shape and is more likely to get what they want than the person who's opposed to war. And this has nothing to do with the goodness or badness. You can go candy rots your teeth and war is bad for everyone. I'm not challenging that. I'm looking here strictly at the nature of how your mind works. If you have a goal of I don't want something, you're creating the something. I don't want to be like him. I would never want to be like her. You understand? I hate him. I don't want to be like that. You may as well take that beingness and clutch it to your bosom and hold on for dear life because that's what you're doing. If you go, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to have accidents. I don't want to have any trouble today. You're going to have loads of it because that's what you're creating. Does that make sense? So you want to be able to work out your goals from a strictly positive viewpoint. I'm not talking about the goodness or badness of the thing you want. See, somebody could go, well, it's really stupid to just simply want a red Corvette when I'm working on world peace. Yes, aren't you fantastic? But, but, but come back to, you pick something specific. So a goal, in order to be achieved, must be specific enough that you could say you would know whether or not you did it. You get that? See, the advantage of a goal like, I'm not pushing this, but the advantage of a goal like a red Corvette, I'm a Porsche man myself, but, but the advantage of, of that kind of goal is you would know exactly if you had done it or not. The following. And then you could check it off as a done and get a new goal. But a goal like I want to be popular, what the hell does that mean? Like who? Whose approval do you need to check that one off? 
I want to be rich. How much money is that? I want to be successful. What would be the definition of success? Other than you have a specific goal and you did it. You wanted to do it and you did it, or you didn't want to do it and you didn't do it. That's success. It wouldn't matter what it was. That makes sense so far. So when we talk about achieving a goal, if you look here, it says the benefits of being unreasonable. It says you succeed when you are unreasonable. You neither give nor accept excuses. You insist on success. L. Ron Hubbard defines reasonableness as faulty explanations. When you agree with faulty explanations, you are too reasonable. Examples of faulty explanations. I can't repair your furnace today as it might rain. Truth is, your repairman is going to a basketball game. None of the staff will work past five. The truth is the manager is not going to want to work past five. I can't pay you as I promised as my wife is sick and can't fix our meals. The truth is he's spending the money elsewhere. But when you have a person who has a faulty explanation, so when you talk about, let's say a real estate agent, I know you've never seen anything like this, but pretend you had a real estate agent, that some of the excuses and reasons that people come up with for failure in real estate is astounding. Well, interest rates went too high. That's not a problem we've had lately. I've been this a long time. I've had a couple, three cycles where interest rates went sky high. I closed an FHA loan at 16.5%. They went to 17.5%. Talk about a fun time. But you, we had people going, I can't succeed because interest rates are too high. But we've had low interest rates, and there are some agents that apparently can't succeed with low interest rates. So the interest rate probably isn't the major why of success or failure. So when we talk here and use the word why, W-H-Y, I want you to think of it as a noun. I want you to think of the word why as a noun, and I'm going to introduce another word as an adjective to describe why, and that is a right why. When you get the right why for a down statistic, you can immediately rectify it and do something about it. If you have the wrong why, you couldn't possibly, it doesn't open the door to fixing anything. So the, the, the data would be the right why opens the door to handling. Not that now. The right why opens the door to handling. A wrong why is, a, is an explanation that doesn't open the door to anything. So let's say you had a baby crying in the middle of the night, and your mama or your daddy, and little Oscar screaming. Now one could have a number of theories on why the kid is crying. Oh, he's hungry. Simple test. Make a bottle of formula, get it at the right temperature, and shove it in his mouth. If you were right with your first guess, he's hungry, he stops crying. And you can go back to bed and sleep yourself. If your guess was incorrect, what does he do? Wham! And you get to hear that same noise some more. Oh, he's wet. And you change his diaper. Only someone as stupid as a psychologist would then go on, if, if the kid was still crying, would to suggest, no, I, we had it correct. That was the reason why. <laughs> you, you follow. If you get the right why, well, maybe he had a nightmare and you hold him for a little while and he calms down. You got it. That was it. But you understand when you get the right why. So somebody who works at a service station might have some guesses on why your car doesn't work right, but a real mechanic knows that when he gets the right reason why, the car runs correctly again. And it's not a matter of an interesting theory. It's a matter of did he find out what was really wrong? And the test is, does it now work correctly? So say you had a down statistic. You're a real estate agent. And your stats went down. You normally had three deals a month, and now you have two deals a month. Or you normally had four deals a month, and now you have one deal a month. Something occurred. Not that, no. Something occurred. Something changed. And if you're dim-witted enough 
to attempt to assign cause elsewhere than yourself, you are now doomed for failure. Does that make sense? So when we talk about a right why, it would have to be something that you could do something about with the resources and abilities you currently have. So anything like, well, if Bush hadn't done blah blah when he was president, or because of that damned Obama, now, you understand, that doesn't work to fix your problem. Well, if Fox News hadn't broadcasted blah blah, I wouldn't feel this way. That doesn't work. You cannot assign, because if you're going to assign cause someplace other than self, you can't fix it. You've just said, it's over there. It'll be up to daddy. It'll be up to mama. You have people walking around where it's up to someone who died years ago who can never come back and fix it for them. And they're still wandering around waiting for permission from someone. They don't quite think of it this way, but that's what they're doing. So we go, the right why opens the door to handling. Does that make sense? Now if you turn the page, in the little box there, well in fact, first I'm going to read this stuff on the way. The most important thing you must be unreasonable about is down statistics. The one big god-awful mistake an executive can make in reading and managing by graph is being reasonable about graphs. This is called justifying a statistic. One sees a graph down and says, oh well, of course that's down, blah, 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 and they have a reason why. When you justify a statistic, you've just explained it away, and you, don't, you, have, you can't fix it. So when a statistic drops, let's say your gross income drops, let's say your net income drops, your number of new contacts drops, your number of listing appointments goes down, the number of buyers, if you work by, the number of buyers you're working with goes down. If the number of buyers you're working with goes down, I can predict with deadly accuracy your number of new buyers into escrow will go down, and guess what will else go down? Your number of closed buyer side deals will go down. It's like magic. Now we have market conditions that change constantly. If you live in the Phoenix area and you're smart, you read what Michael Orr has to say all the time so you can stay current with what's actually happening. His data analysis is stunningly accurate and phenomenally valuable. But you can take that data. I see people that take it and apparently try to turn it on its head and go, well, I don't agree with him. Okay, moron. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, have a nice day. You see other people that turn and go, well, yeah, but he's, you know, there's still sort of an impending doom coming, or there's the shadow inventory, and all these mysterious things that they can't see, and there never was any proof of, but they just know it must be there. And so it's kind of, there's a grimness to it. But the fact of the matter is, it wouldn't matter whether inventory was expanding or contracting. I have one of... One of my, right now, one of my buyer agents, who every time she heard me say in a meeting, inventory was contracting and inventory was shrinking and uh, the number of closed deals was actually sometimes dropping an armless due to decreased inventory. It was like I'd taken a stick and prodded her and pointed out, you're going to fail as a direct result of this. And I spot that this is her reaction and I get with her and I say, look, I'm giving you stats. I'm not giving you reasons to fail. I'm informing you on here's what's happening in the marketplace. I want you to look at it as an opportunity. How can you take that and make it a good thing for you? Uh, that particular conversation took place probably 60 days ago. She currently has 11, almost 12 deals in escrow. At the time she was at one and it was falling out. And inventory did not shoot up. So you go, that's, that's an example. If you looked at the market conditions, you wouldn't go, well, yeah, she got a free ride. No, she didn't. No, she absolutely did not get a free ride from any part. Nothing she did was a free ride from the market. But when you know what the market's doing, 
you're in a position, it's like driving down the road with a clean windshield, as opposed to looking through your rear view mirror and your windshield's covered with mud. It's a difference. So if you look at anything the National Economist churns out, first of all, it's silly crap, they're probably wrong. Anything published by any of the national services, banks, doesn't matter, NAR, it's all crap. Kay Schiller isn't wrong, it's just so out of date by the time they publish it, it's irrelevant. Don't use it. If it's written in the Arizona Republic, it's probably wrong. If they print something correct, just give them a day, they'll fix it for you. It'll be wrong again. <laughs> like, don't get your data there. Like, you don't need, there's nothing they're writing. I swear, there is nothing they ever write that you would need to know of what's happening with the market. It is something you can figure out if you know the market. And they don't have an insight, even when they talk to people who have a correct insight, I won't let them, I won't let them interview me anymore. Because they can't even take a direct quote and get it published correctly. So I tell them anytime they say, can we interview, I go, sure but I want full authority to see the entire article and to prove it before it goes to press. And if you can't agree to that, I don't want to talk to you. They're like, we're not doing that. I go, neither am I. Thanks. Because they can't get a quote right. So the stuff they'll attribute to me, I didn't say it. So I go, I don't know if they do that to everyone. I'm clear on if I know what they're writing about, it's crap. But my point isn't to make fun of them. I'm going, you can get accurate data from Michael or in the Cromford report. It's completely accurate data. So you don't have to go off searching for it. But market conditions do not determine your success. They never have and never will. Now, talk about a statistic going down. I want to read what it says here under the definition of reasonableness. An objective can always be achieved. Most usually when it is not being achieved, the person is finding counter-intention in the environment which coincides with his own, this is reasonableness, and his attention becomes directed to his own counter-intention rather than to his objective. He has interiorized into the situation. I'm going to cover that a few more times. And I promise I won't stop until everyone in the room has it. Okay? An objective can always be achieved. Like, let's say your goal was, I want to make five sales. I don't care. Let's just say I want to sell five houses. Let's make it something you go, is, that a, is it possible for someone to do that? And you all go, yeah, that's possible for someone to do that. <coughs> Most usually, when it is not being achieved, the person is finding, I want you to get that, the person is finding counter-intention in the environment which coincides with his own. The person is finding. This implies he had to look for it. He can't easily do what he wants to do because he either doesn't have enough horsepower or doesn't, or, or, or has, he has a wrong Y, he's doing a funny handling of the wrong Y, he has insufficient oomph, or doesn't care enough about the product to go get it, you understand? And so because, oh, it's kind of hard on me, he has an explanation, which doesn't lead to anything, of why his stats are down. So looks around, how hard would it have been for a real estate agent, say, the last six years, to find people who would agree with him? It's going to be easy to fail. Magic phrases like, well, you know, this economy, for God's sake. You still hear it on television. Well, you know, this what, what is the thought package in there? Contain that, you know, this economy. Sort of like doom, gloom, regret. It's just, you're, you're screwed. Sorry, fella, you've, you've, you're, you're in the wrong business. You're going to fail. And the guy buys into it. Yeah, but but understand, who buys into it if he didn't already have it sitting there in his own head? You get that? He has to be in agreement with it. Well, what, what, imagine Michael Jordan when he was in his prime. 
I'm talking as an athlete, in basketball, imagine if someone said, well, you know, Michael, I don't really think you can make that many baskets. Do you think that would have affected him adversely? Really? No. Do you think he would have gone, oh, why? Uh, but now imagine someone who's not quite learned to play properly yet, and someone who has altitude with them, so I don't think you're cut out for this for it. Could that person buy into that? And reinforce that doubt. But you see how that would work. So if a person has a doubt, like, like think of it this way, on a on your sheet of paper somewhere on the back, write down these three magic words. All by themselves. Yes. Below that, no. And below that, maybe. Those are the three answers to a question like, would you like a cup of coffee? Yes, I want, I'd like one. No. Oh, God. I, um, but it smells good. <laughs> but the caffeine will keep me. Not if you say, God, that smells good. Then you understand. So you get maybe. Maybe they want one. Now in the mind, maybe is yes and no fused together. Would you like to buy a house? Yes, I would. Think, think of the legal definition of a buyer. Ready, willing, and able. I can, I will, and I want to. And I'm, here we go. Is it hard to sell that guy a house? No. Guy says, you want to sell a house? Yes, so what, what's it worth? It's worth this much. Okay, I'll do it. Let's go. He wants to sell. Now, how about the seller who goes, well, yeah, I know those comps, no, I know you think it's worth 150 but I don't care about your comps. It's worth 200 Or pick, pick any number. It's, you know, you think it's worth two. He thinks it's worth four. Does he want to sell? No. Well, yes, sort of. Yes, 400 he does. Yes, he'll we'll sell it at 400 And you go, but it's only worth 200 no, but he wants to sell it for 400 So you have yes, you have no, and you have maybe. And that seller is at maybe. So he doesn't have an unconditional, I've been transferred to Omaha, we're leaving in a week, I'm not going to rent it, I've got to sell it. He's a seller. And you have people who go, yeah, I'm not selling it at your so-called market price. But how about the buyer? There's still people that come to town that would like to make a low offer on a property that's properly priced. And you know what's nice? There are agents that go, okay, what do you think's a fair offer? And of course, you know, this is a really nice way to waste time. Like you can look at the house and go, yeah, it won't last two days at the 200,000 price, but go ahead and make an offer for 175 so you can get practice filling out the form and taking it over to them, emailing it over, and calling the office and saying, do you folks at Century 21 get one? Yeah, we got it. No, it's, yeah, we had four other offers, and they were all above list, and it's gone. Oh, crap. I think that would have been predictable. So you have yes, you have no, you have maybe. Change the question, though. Would you like to buy a house? Would you like to sell a house? Would you like coffee? How about this one? Are you a realtor? Yes. I know. Yes. Yeah. But imagine that question. Are you a realtor? You know that most realtors, seriously, are on a maybe on that question. They don't think of the question that way, but they most certainly are. I gave a talk in this room. Um, this would have been about a year and a half, two, about two years ago. About two years ago, there was a woman seated right where you're seeing, Kristen. And the question she asked, these were new agents that were with John Hall. And I came in to talk to the new agents. And her question was, should I have a website? And I said, well, do you know any big successful companies that don't have websites? No. Do you know any big successful agents that don't have a website? No. She goes, well, yeah, but should I have one? I said, well, are you hoping to screw this up, like, quickly? Or were you going to just, like, drag it out? Just crap up stuff for six, <laughs> eight, maybe nine months and then leave? Or are you going to do it right away? Uh, I think it's a better question because what she was saying to me, like I go, all successful people get one. Yeah, but I don't know if I want one. 
you, you get the beauty of that. So what is her thought process on being an agent? Is that, isn't that, you know, it's, it's maybe, but leaning toward no. And she's new. You get that now. So there are agents going around who are on a maybe on the question, should they be a realtor? I said, well, what if you took the viewpoint, this is what you do for a living, it's what you're going to do for a living for the rest of your working life, and you're going to be a screaming success. Now you tell me, would you have a website? Well, sure, when you put it like that. How else would you like it put? <laughs> you get that, but seriously, why are you doing it? So you go back to, you want to, you want to be on a maybe, hang around buyers and sellers who are on a maybe. That'll work as a technique, by the way. You will find yourself, just hang around them enough, and especially if you don't spot that they are on a maybe, you'll be on a maybe. Hang around agents who are on a maybe, you'll be on a maybe. Because their whole mind is filled with doubt. Now, read this again. An objective can always be achieved. Most usually, when it is not being achieved, the person is finding counter-intention in the environment which coincides with his own. This is reasonableness. Like the person doesn't really have a strong intention to achieve their goal, they'll take any counter-intention in the environment and use it as an excuse to not go where they were going. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. They don't have a clear vision of where they were going in the first place, so you get obvious things like, well, to be a real goal it would have to be specific. To be a real goal, it would probably be in writing if you cared about it. And are you going to have counter-intention that springs up out of your own head that would stop you from achieving the goal? I promise you will. I'll say that again. You write down a goal that matters to you as a goal. You write down a goal that matters to you as a goal. And within minutes, you will have these various reasons you can't achieve the goal start coming into your head. Almost instant, it's like, a, like you pushed a button, like, I need them now. I need those reasons right now of how, how I can't achieve the goal. You with me so far? Yes. So what do you do about it? Buy into that crap and go, yeah, I'm giving up right now? That's one of the choices. Or, how do you rise above it and go toward your goal? I mean, that's the right question. How, like what are you going to do to rise above it and go toward your goal? So let's get this, we have this one just dead on. It said, most usually when it's not being achieved, the person is finding counter-intention in the environment which coincides with his own. This is reasonableness. And his attention becomes directed to his own counter-intention rather than to his objective. Did you get that now? His attention becomes directed to his own counter-intention rather than to his objective. He's interiorized into the situation. His attention is no longer on the goal. It's on all the reasons and explanations and circumstances of why he can't achieve the goal. That makes sense. Now, is there anybody, anybody with any attention on what does it mean when we say, when, when the little box here where it says reasonableness? And for those who are looking at this on the web, I provided a link where you can download this so you can read this word for word too. Okay? So, is there anyone in the room that has a question on this before I go on? Anything. Anything. Does anyone have a question you wish somebody else would ask? Anything. Yeah. 
with what you were talking about initially there, Russell, about <coughs> having a goal and within minutes you're going to have the reasons that you can't accomplish it. Specifically, what do you do to overcome those? I'll cover that in just a second. Perfect question. So how do you overcome the counterintention that your, your mind becomes flooded with? And I want to take it further. How do you overcome the counterintention your mind is going to continually be flooded with? Because you, you have a ton of it. And the way I know you have it is you haven't already achieved that goal. Do you have it? Well, which goal? The counterintention. Well, yes. Oh. But on not on the goals that I've achieved. Like let me let me talk a little bit about mechanically what's involved. So I got this from Mr. Hubbard. It was an issue he wrote called cause. And he said, what you need to do, I'm summarizing, paraphrasing, what you need to do is write down every single area that you feel the effect, rather than be a cause, like you, there's this reason, this this reason you can't succeed. You write them down. So when I was like broke, I had not been a lister other than in my mind. I'd made my living strictly schlepping buyers around. Uh, any listing I'd ever gotten up to that point in my life, uh, it was either a buyer who I'd already sold a house, like I already knew him, like it was either a friend, family, or somebody I'd sold a house for that already knew me, liked me, and trusted me. And so I didn't have to be competent as a lister. I only knew how had to fill out the forms. This is, this is the competence level of most agents when it comes to listings. They're not really adept at getting listings. What they're good at is taking the ones that sort of come their way. I, my credit was shot. I had lousy credit and I had no cash. And the reasons I had on being a lister, uh, well, you have to have a nice car. Well, I couldn't have a nice car. I drove a piece of shit. <laughs> uh, and I had no credit, and that wasn't going to be changing anytime soon. So nice car was out of the question. And so if having to have a nice car was a requirement for being a lister, I was screwed right there. Then had, uh, it seemed like listers I'd met some of them wore suits. I didn't have the money to buy suits. Uh, crap, that's another one. Uh, most of them <laughs> seemed energetic. Uh, my erratic sleep schedule was going to completely preclude me always feeling energetic. Uh, so I had this, these reasons. And my application of it was to specifically say, in writing, so we go back to a goal being in writing, to list out, I wanted to list that year 50 houses. And I found that as time went by, I would change the 50 to 100 to 150 to 200 to 250 to 300 to 400 and so forth. Those numbers have changed for me, but the, the concept hasn't changed at all. Like that year, I wanted to list 50 houses. I wanted to close a certain number of deals, and I wanted to make a certain amount of money, which was more than I'd ever made before, which would be a big reason to not have it be a real number. So if you take whatever amount you're making, it doesn't impress you. Like, there may be someone in the room that goes, well, I, I'm all, I only make 300. Or somebody else says, I've only made 50. But whatever the number is, that number doesn't impress you. But triple it, that's sort of impressive. You, you understand, if you're making 50,000 a year, and now your goal's 150, it's slightly unreal because you've never done it. If you make 150 and your goal is 600, it's slightly unreal because you've never done it. But you put the goal in writing, and you'd work out mathematically how many deals would you need to close at your average price to hit that target. And I highly recommend you do not change your, make some change assumption on your average price. Whatever your average price is, go with it. The number that would be the variable would be the number of deals. And that, that's a big one. If you get agents with uh, luxury agents that do 10 houses a year and they lose one deal, they just lost 10% of their annual income. If I lose a deal, I honestly don't care. So I'm, I'm just saying, 
you're not you're not looking for like so I, I, I you know when I see somebody that does five deals a year and go yeah but I sold five million yeah and so one deal and twenty percent of your income is gone I don't bad business model in my opinion and it's the kind of stuff that gets people really 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 antsy over factors they can't personally causally control like somebody changed their mind it happens it's like what's a normal fallout rate on escrows how about in this market ten percent whatever if you get if you do enough business whatever the title company's number is it'll be your number find out what the title company's fallout rate is it'll be your fallout rate when the market was crazy with some prime the fallout rate was twenty percent normal times it's a ten percent fallout so you have to plan for a 10% fallout rate once you get them into escrow. I just don't know which 10% are falling out. And I'm not trying to know it. You understand? Like on listing appointments, you, stay, you have stuff like, oh, I don't know, Craig Proctor even says, learn to list 98% of the appointments you go on. How about this? That's a stupid number. He never hit it, and no one ever hits it that does a lot of listings. If you're only going to list your family, people you already know, you, you understand, unless you've got one of these amazing Rolodexes, you go, no, I actually have 4,000 people in my Rolodex. And, yeah, okay, then I'll take my state. But otherwise, I go, you're not going to list 98%. If I go back over, like, we, it got a little crazy during the short sale era because we were pre-qualifying them with the, 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 before we ever took the, went to book the appointment. But if I were to take a 15, even now, if I were to take a 15 year period of time and go for the highest percentage we ever hit consistently of listing appointments to listings taken was 56.6, but, but less, less than 57%. So for every 1,000 appointments, 570 were listings, actually 560 something for every 1,000. And we, we had a really novel way of counting appointments. We drove over to their house, they were home, and we went in. It counts as an appointment. And we either walked out with a listing or we didn't walk out with a listing. So I don't want any of my statistics determined by an egotistical need to go, oh no, everyone loves me so much. How about crazy people? What if you book an appointment and you get to their house and they're crazy? I'm talking just crazy. Do you actually want the business? Are you, have you done something bad that you feel you need to be punished? Where you, you know you've done wrong. We're not even going to talk about it here tonight, what you did, but it's awful. And if you'll just take that listing, they'll have the right to call you every day and talk to you about what a crappy person you are and how you're letting them down. Would you really want that listing? So is the purpose of a listing appointment to get the listing no matter what? How about would it be to see if you want the listing, and then can you get it? So there's some people, what if the price you know in your heart, at above two and a quarter, walk away? And they won't list it for less than 275. Do you want the listing? Is there any advantage that you know if I can just get enough signs resting in different yards, I feel I'm successful? I don't know. So they don't really want to sell it. You understand? Do you, why would you want the business? They're hard to get along with. Again, why would you want the business? So, or let's suppose you want the business. They seem like nice people. It's a saleable property. They're going to price it right. And they have a commission number in mind that's half of what you, what you charge. Well, the guy from uh, he'll, this company will do it for us at that. Oh, my God, I'll match it. Okay. I think that's a stupid business model. I think that's a really stupid business model. But if that's your business model, be my guest. But my point is, there's going to be listings you're not going to get. No matter how good you get. And there's going to be listings you don't want. So the, the key would be go on a lot of appointments to get a lot of listings. So this is just as a point. But come back to, I made my goals specific, I made my targets very specific, and then I listed off all these reasons and explanations where these were reasons I could not succeed. 
get that. Wrote them down. Wrote them down. I've, I've talked about this all over the country, and I've had people say, what do you do with the list after you make it? Burn it? And I go, never. Never. I recommend you make it in Word. You don't burn it. If you're ashamed of some of the reasons, make it a locked file. But never. No. What is the purpose of the list? Well, if you have these ideas that you've clearly categorized as reasons to fail, what would be a good name for a list like that? Here are the reasons that exist in my head. I'm now smart enough that's no longer only in my head. I have it in writing outside of my head where I can look at it. Here is a failure viewpoint. I've identified a thought that was in my head that I was using to justify failing. You got that now. I called it my enemy line list. What would the enemy, if there was one, and I'm not even suggesting there would be, but what would be an idea that they could stick into your head? This has nothing to do with subconscious or program. Just, just here, believe this. And you'd go, okay, I'll believe it. And that idea alone would booby trap you where you couldn't succeed. Those are, that is what those things consist of. Where do those ideas come from? I don't even care. I'll tell you where most of them came from. You, when you were tired and hungry. You were physically tired. You were physically exhausted. You were low blood sugar and maybe irritated about something. And you thought it up yourself. So I don't even want to imply it was like, oh, the devil. No, no, it's just some crap you thought up. And because you thought it up, it stuck. The validity of that fantastic idea was it came from you. And you've been carting it around with you ever since and using it to fail. So you get these ideas out of your head in writing so that when you think that dumb thought again, Imagine, I go, well, you have to have a nice car, and I look at that, and it's funny. Well, I can't use it anymore. You understand? I can't use it to fail. You get it out. I remember I was at one talk, this was earlier this year, and a woman, she lives in, 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 in Alabama, and she goes, well, what do you, uh, what do you call this? And I go, well, if you're right, you're right. Is it what? And she said, what if it's a real thing? She said, you see, some of the stuff you talked about, what if it's a real thing? And I said, oh, make sure you put it on the list. But she said, no, I, I mean it's a real thing. And I go, make sure you get it on your list. It's something you're using daily to justify failing. Because, like, let's say a woman goes, well, I have three kids. Make sure it's on your list. If you're using it to justify failing, well, I have to be a good mother. There's no statement here to do anything but that. If you have an idea that is somehow, because this is the crap you'd be using to hold yourself back. So you take any area, but, but again, let's, go, let's look at the definition of reasonableness. An objective can always be achieved. Most usually, when it is not being achieved, the person is finding counterintention in the environment which coincides with his own this is reasonableness, and his attention becomes directed to his own counterintention rather than to his objective. Do you see how that would work? You think of the goal, your attention goes to the barrier, and the barrier is the thing you put there yourself. No one else could have installed it quite so perfectly. You put it there. This is not a make wrong. I'm telling you, here's how to bypass it. Just list out the crap. List out every reason you can think of that could be a barrier to you achieving your goal. I don't care what it is. The economy, this, that, uh, money rates are rising, uh, inventory's tight, inventory's plentiful, whatever the hell it is. Write it down. And what's funny is you could sit there for hours and write the stuff down. The next day you'll think of something else. Go back and add it to your list. You're driving along in traffic a couple of days later. Oh, I just thought of another one. Put it on the list. 
How long can the list get? As long as you want it to get. If you think of something, if you can think of something that is some idea you have in your head <coughs> that you think of, that you go, well, that would be a reason that would hold me back, get it on the list. Get it on the list so that you don't have to go the effect of it anymore. Label it for what it is. Poison. Bad stuff. Did I get your question answered? Anything else? Anything. Anything. For those watching this on video, we'll drill silent right now. <laughs> <laughs> Anything. So Maybe this is not the right time to ask this? No, I, that, whatever it is, I'm sure it's the right time. Ask it. Okay. Yeah. Would you give me three ideas of, that I can implement? Would now? I give you three ideas that you could implement to do what? To increase my business. Well, the idea is to increase anyone's business. It's not, I don't know that I have three. You, you really, two. well, I'm going to really talk <laughs> about one. It's just the thing. Like you look at what is the core, what is the core skill for, take what any business, let's, let's not even talk about realtors at first. Let's talk about any business. What's the most important skill to have to, to have a business? And that, that skill becomes always to get and keep customers. There, there's nothing more important than the ability to get and keep customers. If you look at a, real, a working real estate agent and you say, what is the skill that stands head and shoulders above all the other skills that matters the most, that if you're successful at that one skill, if you get good at it, it wouldn't matter how bad you were at the others. Now understand, I'm not recommending being bad at the others. I'm just making a statement here. That if you're good enough at this one thing, you could be awful at the other ones and still be a screaming success. If you're bad at this one, it won't matter how good you are at all of the other ones, you're going to fail. And that skill is lead generation. There's a companion skill of lead conversion, and oddly enough, there are a number of agents that are very, very good at lead conversion that are awful at lead generation. They've gotten so damn good at lead conversion, it's allowed them to be awful at lead generation, and they sometimes still manage to do a big giant face plant, you understand, because they don't have anyone to talk to. They don't have any customers because they haven't generated enough leads. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the most important skill of all would be lead generation. There is nothing that would compare you. Well, I don't really know. My broker said I need to be terrific at writing contracts. Actually, you don't. If you were good enough at lead generation, you can hire an attorney fresh out of law school to come with you everywhere <laughs> and just tell them, if I go to an appointment, you're coming with me. And if it's paper, you pick it up. Don't even let me fill it out. Whatever it is, you take care of it. And there's not a damn thing they won't know how to fill out. I promise. They, they, won't, they can just read it once. No, this, this is what they're trained. I'm serious. So you wouldn't even have to be good at contracts. You wouldn't really have to know about contracts if you were good enough at lead generation. Now, you get into what is then apparently an incredibly complex subject. It's made more so every day by all kinds of gurus and people teaching the subject and oh my god it's complex and this person's a Facebook expert and this guy's a Twitter expert and you have other social media and are you LinkedIn and pinned and this and that and go good <laughs> god. Here's the deal. There's exactly two ways to lead generate. They are as follows. Marketing and prospecting. End of the list. I've heard people who are nincompoops say, well, everything is marketing. If you're eating dinner by yourself, I will not describe it as marketing. If you're going to the bathroom, I don't really think that's marketing. So everything isn't marketing. Marketing is where you do something to get the customer or consumer to reach toward you. Best Buy, for instance, is a business that's built strictly on marketing. Amazon, strictly marketing. Uh, K 
Callaway's business. Started off geographic farming, which is a combination of marketing and prospecting, and at this point would be almost exclusively marketing. My business is a marketing business. When I started, how did I get my listings? Working FISBOs, expireds, door to door. How come? Because I had no money, and that was the only thing I could do. You understand? So that was prospecting. Prospecting is where you reach out to them. Keller Williams, for example, is a company that's been built on prospecting, not marketing. The entire company has been built on prospecting. And to this day, it's not a marketing company. It's a prospecting company. Craig Proctor teaches only marketing because it's all he knows. And he mostly markets Craig. You get someone like Mike Ferry who's stuck into, you should always knock on doors. And any time you do marketing, it's a stupid, bad thing. In fact, if you farm and go back to the same place, it's awful for him. So you get diff different oddities. You get people who were good at one thing who then will try to explain to everyone it's the only thing. It's not true. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways to market. And there's lots and lots and lots of different ways to prospect. There's some people who like going to meetings. I don't know. I'm not making a joke. They, they're into Kiwanis or Rotary or whatever. And they go, I get most of my business from people I know. That's a wonderful system. Seriously, it's a wonderful system. It doesn't happen to be my system. And it doesn't happen to be something I want to ever do. But I'm not saying it's not a wonderful way to do it. But that's prospecting. So you have just these two methods. And your objective would always be, so you go back to how would you get more business? The only possible way to get more business is one way or another reach more people. And that's an important point. And anytime that point is missed, someone, whatever they're going to do is going to fail. The only possible way, like if you're selling 20 houses a year and you want to sell 40 houses a year, or if you're selling 40 houses a year and you want to sell 80 houses a year, and by the way, to go from 10 to 20, just decide. Like seriously, just decide to do it. Like what do you need to do? Just decide. That's it. What else? Just decide to do it. To go from 20 to 40, you'll have to have some systems, probably, if you're going to stay at that level. And to go from 40 to 80, you most certainly need some systems and some infrastructure. But it's still a decision. It's never anything but a decision. And if you're doing 20 deals a year and you want to do 40 deals a year, you would have to spend twice as much time or somehow do twice as much, I get this next part, of what mattered. And most of the stuff most agents do doesn't matter. And the proof of it is, let's take Keller Williams and go the average Keller Williams agent per year sells six houses. The last time in a, what I'm going to call uh, what would have been at the time considered a normal market, uh, John Hall, uh, for years, the average John Hall agent sold ten and a half houses a year. That included with my production and Callaway's production mixed in. It was still 10.5 average. Colwell Banker's number was 11. Uh, Realty Executives was at 22. They were bragging about it. Uh, Remax was at 23 houses per year, and they bragged about it. Uh, I think that Remax is now down to about 18 houses per year per average Remax agent. Uh, these kinds of numbers are not spectacular, and these are what are considered the successful agents. So you go back to, if you took, how long does it take to sell a house to a person? And if you literally use the stopwatch, if you use the stopwatch and said, how long will it take to sell a house to a guy? And every time, just like an attorney, you were on the clock now, if you were talking to them or taking the title company, whatever, you get some number that's roughly between two and a half and three and a half days. Everything combined. Two and a half to three and a half days. So if someone sells ten houses a year, how many days are they working? A year. With what could be classified as dollar productive activities. You get what I just said there? 
if somebody's selling 10 houses a year, they are working about a month out of the year doing something that could be mattered. Like if you said we're going to have a 40-hour work week, that's 2,000 hours a year. They're, they, they can't be working more than a month. The, they, they, if they were doing nothing but dollar productive activities, they could literally make the same money working oh, really one day a week, take the rest of the week off. Causatively, just get the hell, and, and no, I don't take calls, I don't show properties, only on Monday. <laughs> it would work better than what most of them do. But you understand, it would work better. So you get, you, you look and go, what are they doing? Well, something that doesn't matter. Something that doesn't lead to business directly or indirectly. So when you see someone selling 10, 20, 30 houses a year, you at once know that they're spending very little actual time on the most important thing of all, which is lead generation. You know that immediately. They can't possibly be spending very much time on it, because even if they're awful at it, they would get a better result than, say, 15 or 20 houses a year. So the thing to concentrate on would be what produces the sales, and it would be the leads. See, I've found most agents, if you hand them a customer, they're actually pretty darn good at taking care of them. Like, for the most part, you know, you have people make uh, Snyder marks or something about, well, uh, they're not thought of any higher than lawyers or used car salesmen, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, the biggest single complaint the public has about realtors is the same complaint that realtors have about other realtors. They won't return a phone call. Like, the single biggest complaint the public has with realtors is the same identical complaint that realtors have with other realtors. They won't return a phone call. That's not exactly unethical or deceitful, it's just slovenly. But you have people who are just out of communication. So you get people doing things that don't lead to more business. What leads to business? Well, you have two categories. You're going to market effectively or you're going to prospect. If you don't have a ton of money, you could front end it, you're going to prospect. And one of the advantages of prospecting is you can find out right now whether your message is a good one or not. It's a very expensive thing to find it out in an ad. Like a, a full page ad in the paper. You could say, could a full page ad work if you say the right thing? If you say the wrong thing, it will be wasted the money. See, like in 2003, 2004, I had an ad on the air that said, I can sell your house in spite of the market. When that ad was running in late 2004, it was so stupid as to be unbelievable. I still had it running. I go, well, it's in spite of the market. Hell, a busboy could have sold their home in spite of the market. <laughs> Quite literally. And some busboys did sell homes in spite of the market. You understand? In spite of being a busboy. So you get that. So the message would have to match what the public thinks of the market. Not even what the market is, what the public thinks of the market. If you're prospecting, you have the opportunity to correct your message almost immediately. So in your prospecting, you're either going to talk to people you already know, which we'd call your previously met database, even if you're not keeping a database, or you're going to talk to previously unmet. What your objective would be to, to find unmets and convert them to mets. Get that right there. You'd be, or to contact, if you had a big enough met, previously met database, to contact and stay in touch with. That would be the number one method of generating more business, is contacting your previously met database individually, by phone, by mail, showing up in person, whatever, somehow getting in touch with those people who already know you. And if you don't have very many people in your previously met database, then the answer changes to get people in your previously met database. That'd be the answer to your question. Yes. Uh, does this anything wrong with Facebook? There's nothing wrong with it. That's not the point. Is they, they're, they're, the amount of business they're doing is so far beyond anything you could get from something like that. Be somebody going, 
well, I go to Rotary once a month and I get all my business there. It must be a really big Rotary Club or you're not doing very much business. <laughs> you know, you get somebody, there's towns like, uh, like, like Whitman or something like that or, uh, to the west and you go, their, their total number of houses in, in the MLS is 150. Uh, the total number of sales per year is 120 or something. There's little towns, that's it. Well, if you had all the business, it's not very much. So you want to look at how much, what, how many would you need to go, I'm happy with this level. And you'd find, well, how many contacts is that going to take? How many impressions is it going to take? And you start getting the concept of orders of magnitude. I think the biggest problem agents have when they start going, looking upward, is they're not confronting the magnitude of how big they need to think to hit the target because it's not when you become big, so to speak. It's not like, oh my God, I'm so effective now. Everyone, why, if we, if we, if they hear my name, they're going to list with. No, that's not true. You have to contact some one way or the other more people. So whatever method or methods you're using to contact people. You'd have to be more of them and more often. But, the, but it would ultimately come down to that, no matter what. That would be the thing. So if you go, well, I'm making 25 in-person contacts a year now. Well, you, well, there's people, that's about what they're doing. Change it to 25 a month. Then change it to 25 a week. You, you get the idea. You, when you get it up to a certain level, you do more business. That would be the correct answer. That answer your question for you? I think so. Good. Thank you, Thank you very much. My pleasure. Any question? Anything else? Anything? You guys are easy. Yeah. What do you think someone watching this video, what do they want to know that we didn't cover? Nothing. Okay. So if you, were going to, if you were going to start doing, if you were doing lead generation by phone, cold calling. I don't like cold calling. So I don't either. That. I, I don't. But think, I don't know where else to go. Yeah. You could sit open houses. Yeah, that would be. You know, there's so many things you could do. I, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't cold call. I think that cold calling has the. Uh, it, it, you'll like it the least. You'll want to quit it the fastest. I think there's so many things a person can do that are so much more effective than cold calling. Like you've been in business over 30 years that I know of. I remember having a cross sale with you over 30 years ago, so we're both old. Uh, <laughs> so so here, here's the deal. What I would do, no, this is, I'm, I'm, this is seriously, I would make a list. The first thing I would tell you to do, if you go, I don't, I, you want to make some calls. Uh, I, I said the same thing to Scott a couple of weeks ago. Make a list of people that would recognize you on site. Like if they saw you, they would go, hi, Dan. Like they would know it's you. And find something. I don't care if it's a Phoenix Sun schedule or a list of libraries or a whatever the hell. If, if somebody handed you one of them, you'd go, well, thank you. Like you'd be happy to get one. So you could go, well, that'd be in the Phoenix Symphony. Right? Whatever the hell it is. Something that you could get, make a list of some kind Put your picture, put your phone number on it, have them printed up, and take one to them. Pop by and go, was just in the area, wanted to give you one of these. And the reason I'm not trying to survey them is I can't, but if I survey you and get you to pick something, you know, I'd really be happy if I got one of these. You'll feel great handing them out. You understand? You'll feel great handing them to somebody, you won't feel phony. And hand one to them, and leave. And so I just wonder, just pop by, say hi, and if you know anybody that needs to buy or sell in the house, please keep me in mind. And then get the hell out. You do that with a hundred people face to face. You will physically have, unless you have a couple of assistants, more business than you can take care of by yourself. That would be my answer. That would be my answer. It's not cold calling. It goes back to the Mendoza thing of like warm calling. Like there's people you know, and you go, well, what am I going to go to say to them? I came by to give you one of these, and wow. give them something that you'd be that you'd be happy if you got one. 
I did that 25 times in the spring and got nothing from it. Oh my God. Crap. i quit business if I were you. Or, <laughs> or uh, do it 75 more times. Like, the 25 is a really small sampling, number one. And the other thing... Well, this was a ketchup, mustard, and relish. Yeah. Well, the other thing that enters into it is you're assuming, like, remember my nephew, who's a real estate agent in Glendale, California. And I remember I told him uh, we were going to up his business, and I said, I want you to make a list of all your deals the last year, and I want you to tell me how you got each one of them. This was an actual conversation with my nephew Dustin. He was with Remax at the time. And he goes, well, how will I know how you got them? Well, you, the, how did the customer come to you? I want to know how the customer came to you. So he, he tells me, the, I said, well, give me the address of the house, and where how the customer come? Well, the guy named Charlie told him to call. Okay? How did Charlie, uh, how did Charlie know your name? I don't know. Get, the, get Charlie's phone number from the customer and call Charlie. Call him? Yeah, on the phone, call him. What do I say to him? Uh, you can start by thanking him for sending you whatever the hell that guy's name was, and then ask him how he got your number. Oh, yeah, no, do it. I insist. So he calls Charlie. Then he calls me back, Dustin does, and says, uh, yeah, uh, somebody else told Charlie to call. Who? I don't know. Call him back. Call Charlie back. <laughs> and he goes, call him back? Yeah, on the phone, just like you did the first time. You got his number this time, so just call him back and say, I forgot to ask you who told you to call me. And he does, and gets like, let's call the guy Bob. A uh, guy named Bob. And how did Bob get your number? Ready for his answer? I don't know. <laughs> Guess what my response was? Call Bob. How do I call Charlie? And do it again. And he gets that one. And finally, it traces to he was out passing out cards talking to someone he actually slightly knew, gave them a card, that guy gave the card to a different guy who then gave Dustin's phone number to, and he got a sale. But you understand, he was contacting people in his previously met database. So when you have agents asking for referrals, and I think the idea that you would ever call someone, ever, 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 and they would go, oh God, I'm glad you called. Uh, I had three referrals for you. Uh, we were going to give them to the Remax guy, but uh, you can have them. Uh, like that they had them ready, or that they'd been working on this, or they'd been thinking about it. No. You, if you know anybody, or think of anybody that wants to buy or sell a house, please keep me in mind. And leave. If they like you, you've, you've become more real to them by physically showing up. And... They think of they think oh yeah my friend Willie wants whatever the hell it is that's but they're not going to be waiting so you called you know, 25 people okay you need to do more than that so it's orders of magnitude like you'd either need to change what you're handing out uh, but but show up be nice give them something that you consider valuable and get the hell out that'd be the deal and do it long. A lot, lots of times, do it often, do it frequently, because you're really basically, you're going to ask in person for business, you're going to ask on the phone for business, or you're going to do it via mails or postcards. The most effective will always be in person, always, always, always. Would you do the same hundred people every month? Or every no. Three months? If they're people you know well, you could do the same hundred people every three months, but I would suggest doing that hundred people and then expanding your previously met database and doing it with more people. I think the biggest mistake, I mean, if I look at, when I, when I remember when I first started, I, I was in the business long enough to lose customers to the fact that my previous customer was now an agent in real estate. You understand? Like, Either they'd become an agent, their parents had become an agent, or one of their kids became an agent. You don't keep that business. So go back to my hundred people. If you have a static list, it'd be like Cadillac years ago. 
all their customers were dying. They were getting old, just dying, old age. Cadillac had to change, this was before the Escalade existed. They had to change their marketing, they had to change their image, they had to change their product line, and they'd have gone out of business. So if you have a list of 100, you better be growing that list just to keep it at 100. Because it won't say a static 100. People move out of the area. Uh, one of the things if you, to get referrals from sellers is a little trickier than getting referrals from buyers. The buyer is really happy, he's emotionally invested, and he's still here. You sell a house for someone who moved to Dallas or Wichita or you know, Miami, they may think the world of you, but none of the people they see at work anymore go, what agent would you use in Phoenix? They don't give a crap, they don't live in Phoenix. So you lose, there's an attrition to just people moving away. So you'd want to always be expanding your number of previously met. Always, always, always. There's no substitute for that. And you're either going forward or you're going backward. So I would add that into the thing too. Now let me just touch back here on reasonableness to see if there's any little part of this. And then we'll wrap up. An objective can always be achieved. Most usually when it is not being achieved, the person is finding counter-intention in the environment which coincides with his own. This is reasonableness. And his attention becomes directed to his own counter-intention rather than to his objective. Any question on that? Any question on that? I would say to anyone, like if, if you can just handle this, if you find yourself so stuck on something you can't get it out of your head, I want you to get Sherry Reeves' phone number before you leave or get hers or do something. That's what she does. She unsticks that crap for people. But in most cases, you're going to find if you just simply make, it, just get it out of your head and write it down. Where you put it in Word or write it on a yellow pad, something where you've got, here's a stupid idea I've been using. You don't have to use it anymore. You can label it correctly. Here's some mental poison. You can go, well, it's a fact. It's in the news every day. Put it on the list. If low interest rates or high interest rates or uh, constricted inventory, anything that you can come up with as a reason to fail for what you're doing, there's something that goes on the list. Because market conditions will change. They are, the interest rates will change. Well, who's in the business is going to change. All, there's all kinds of things that will be changing that you don't have the slightest control over. Prices are going to change. You don't control the average price per square foot, whether it moves up or down, and you don't control the median price here or somewhere else. So different things can change. But if you're using any of those things as ideas, as reasons to fail, that goes on your list. Because there's an idea you're going, I'm using this to justify failing. And it's not, you don't need to do that. You can succeed. Because if you had, go back to the example of your baby is crying in the middle of the night. And your mama. Don't tell me you would buy in to that stupid crap of some little, no, that's your baby. That's your baby. You understand? That's your baby. You're going to do whatever the hell you have to do to fix it for your baby. Isn't your business your baby? Yeah. If it's not your baby, whose baby is it? You understand what I'm saying? That's the deal. So you take and you just go, if you care about it, you just get whatever reason, whatever, whatever crap's in the way, get it out of the way. That's all there is to it. You just get it out. Of, you go, there's a dumb idea. Like, let's say the baby, well, I'm tired, I haven't had enough sleep for five nights in a row, and I'm exhausted, and now he's crying. He won't stop crying. Okay. You're tired. It's 3 a.m. So the question is, do you take him to the hospital now or not? You understand. I don't know a parent who hasn't had that happen. And when it happens, you go, I'm scared. Well, of course you're scared, and you're tired. But you do what you have to do. Always. This is the same deal. This is this, you, you're gonna, you're gonna succeed or you're gonna fail, not in direct proportion to how tall you are, how short you are, how fat you are, how skinny, how young, how old, none of that crap matters. 
None of it. None of it. it none of that stuff will matter. But how high your care factor is, that'll matter. That will absolutely matter. And what your willingness is to do whatever the hell you have to do to get the show on the road, that will matter. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. You've been fabulous. Hope this has helped solve the problem too.